Hegemonic Discourses of Difference and Inequality, Right-Wing Organizations in Austria by Bridget Sauer and Edma and Jovnik. Introducing right-wing discourses on difference and inequality from margin to mainstream. A discussion on right-wing discourses in Austria inevitably has to start by referring to the Austrian Freedom Party. The FPO is not only the major right-wing player in Austria's political landscape and a competitor in the two established parties, the Social Democrats and the Christian Conservative Austrian People's Party, but also one of the pioneers of the right-wing populism in Europe. In 1999 national elections, the FPO won 26.91% of the vote, the same percentage as the OVP. As the result, the OVP formed a coalition government with the FPO in 2000. While in the following elections, the FPO lost about 16% of its votes, the party has recovered since then. In the most recent national elections, the FPO was third with 20.5% of the vote, and 19.7% at the European Parliament elections in 2014. Although it seems that the FPO is occupying the right-wing political space in Austria, in recent years, smaller groups and organizations like the Austrian version of Pegida, Patriotic Europeans Against the Islamization of the Occident, identitarian movement and smaller citizens initiatives have gained importance in the public visibility with single issue strategies focusing on immigration and religion. The ongoing debate on the building of mosques and Islamic cultural centers, for instance, has been addressed by citizens initiatives which protested against the construction of these buildings. Most of these initiatives are no longer active, but in 2007-2008, they were mobilized thousands of people with their concerns, and in 2011, they formed the network movement Pro-Austria. Although FPO and citizens' initiatives differ, one being a party, while the initiatives can be perceived as civil society organizations, they have a lot in common and seem to complement each other. Together, they construct and promote hegemonic discourse and difference and inequality, especially regarding issues of migration. Muslims and the Islam Both FPO and citizens' initiatives not only construct similar images of the immigrant and Muslim other, but they cooperate on local and community levels, for instance in Vienna. There has been much literature in recent years seeking to explain the emergence and growth of the political right in Austria. Some of this literature refers to Austria's fascist past, others to the tradition of the country's political culture of consensus and the closed two-party system up in the 1990s. Others refer to the neoliberal restructuring of the formerly strong Austrian welfare state. This chapter intends to add two new aspects to this literature. It first aims at contributing to the explanation of the success of the right-wing populist and extremist groups in Austria by analyzing how they organize consent around issues of migration and thus create hegemony by immobilizing racist, sexist, and homophobic arguments of natural or cultural difference, inequality, and hence exclusion. This struggle for consent based on shared understanding, moreover, invokes images of a natural binary constellation between them and us, partly referring to an existing discourse of difference in Austria. The antagonistic change of equivalence between them and us not only turns migrants, Muslims, LGBT people, feminists, and the elite into others, but forges these narratives into a perspective of difference and inequality, of belonging and non-belonging. Second, we want to better understand the counter-strategies of anti-discrimination and anti-fascist civil society groups and assess their success or failure. While the Austrian political right has gained electoral success and has been able to influence public debates on immigration, several organizations and initiatives exist that try to fight discrimination, hate speech, and racism. 
Some of their public activities, for example, the Festival of Joy, enjoy widespread popularity. Nevertheless, these anti-racist groups seem to be unable to stop the wave of successes of right-wing groups or to create a counter-hegemonic compromise against practices of inequality and exclusion. We contend that right-wing hegemony on exclusionary racism explains how difficult it is for anti-discrimination groups to establish a counter-strategy to the right-wing discourse of difference and inequality. This chapter focuses on one hand the FPO and the Venice Citizens Initiatives against mosques and Islamic cultural centers, and on the other hand, the seven NGOs fighting racism and discrimination. The chapter draws on interviews with four members of the FPO and three members of the Citizens Initiatives conducted in 2013. In the pre-election atmosphere of 2013, top FPO functionaries were not available for interview. Therefore, our FPO interviewees came from the lower ranks of federal, municipal, and district level. The sample was composed of one female member of the FPO's federal council and two male members of the municipal councils and one male member of the district council, and the spokespersons of three Venice initiatives against mosques. We also attended one of the citizens' initiatives' regular tables and did ethnographic research. During our participation and observation, we listened without intervening to the agenda of meetings with questions, bearing in mind, however, that our mere presence as researchers was an intervention. We made field notes during and after the observations. The aim of our observation was to grasp the agenda of the meeting and to identify the roles of participants and the organization and their interactions. To interpret this material, we conducted a content analysis and identified how, by applying much images, metaphors, and symbols right-wing populist group use, produce and reproduce racist and sexist narratives in the discourse of difference and inequality. Furthermore, we interviewed seven representatives of Vienna-based organizations engaging in anti-racism, anti-fascism, and anti-discrimination work. The organizations we interviewed can be divided into two groups. First engages in legal, psychological, and social counseling. The second focuses on advocacy work by campaigning against racism, right-wing populist discourse, and practices of exclusion and othering. Unfortunately, we were not able to recruit self-organizations of migrants or asylum seekers for the interview. The chapter argues as follows. We begin our discussion with the contextualization of the political situation of right-wing populist parties and organizations as well as NGOs fighting right-wing extremism and racism. To understanding both the rise of the right-wing populism and the struggles of anti-racist and anti-discrimination forces requires a contextualization in terms of both transformation of political parties since World War II and the neoliberalization of Austrian society and politics since the mid-1990s. Then we elaborate on our concepts of cultural hegemony and social racism, on racism as a shared value and social practices of building consensus. Racism, we argue, is not located at the margins but in the center of modern Western societies. Also, we conceptualize racism as an ongoing process as a struggle over meaning, structures, and activities correspond, hence, to racist narrations, narrations of inequality. To be successful, racism needs to become a shared attitude. Therefore, our analysis concentrates on the assessment of metaphors, symbols, and narratives of right-wing populist groups and their way of creating racist change of equivalence by mobilizing antagonism in the fields of migration, Islam, gender relations, and sexual orientation. Thereafter, we scrutinize possible factors in the Austrian right-wing success by analyzing the discourses of difference and inequality promoted by the FPO as well as the citizens' initiatives. Right-wing actors not only claim freedom of speech and the right to tell the truth about the Islam and migration problems, but, as we shall see, they mainstream their perspectives on others presenting their worldview as common, shared one by referring to conflicts 
and antagonistic structures of the Austrian society. Finally, we present counter-hegemonic strategies and the struggle against right hegemony by anti-racist and anti-discrimination groups. We elaborate the strategies undertaken by these organizations to oppose right-wing discourse and hegemony. Right-wing populism in Austria, contextualization. Right-wing populism today has to be contextualized first in the country's political landscape after World War II and second in the neoliberal social and political transformations that have occurred since the mid-1990s. Furthermore, contextualizing Austrian right-wing populism is ultimately linked to the emergence of the Freedom Party Austria, which has dominated right-wing populist discourse since the late 1980s. As we argue elsewhere, most currently emerging right-wing populist movements and initiatives in Austria do not seem to compete with the FPO, but rather complement their claims. The Austrian FPO, different from other right-wing parties in Europe, has a long tradition in the legacy of National Socialism. After World War II, members of the former National Socialist Party in Austria were given the opportunity to form a new party, the Union of Independence. In 1955, the year of Austria's independence from the occupying powers, the United States, UK, France, and Soviet Union, the party was renamed as FPO, but remained embedded in German national ideology and anti-Semist frames. While in the following decades, the FPO modernized its ideology and organizational structures, the German national tradition shapes the ideology of the FPO to this day. The party's notion of the folk and the homeland, for instance, can be traced back to German national ideology. The high-value term of fatherland or home triggers many emotional connotations and addresses a more evocative and solidarity-promoting meanings than state or nation. It is therefore mainly used by German nationalists who endorse an ethnically defined nation alluding to a greater German nation. Due to its fascist past and tradition, the party was for a long time excluded from the wider political landscape. Post-Austrian war democracy from the 1950s was organized as social partnership in a consociational democracy. After World War II, the experience of the Civil War at the beginning of the 1930s, the two major parties, the Social Democrats and Christian Conservative OVP, the Trades Unions, the Chamber of Labor, and the Austrian Chambers of Trade engaged in a rather closed system of consensual decision-making, mainly, but not only in the field of economic and labor market policies. In effect, this system divided social and political power between two established parties. This division of power often institutionalized as great coalitions in government between the two parties worked until the end of the 1980s, leaving hardly any room for other parties or movements. However, Austrian modernization from above, from the 1970s, slowly opened the political system up to social movements and new parties. In 1986, George Hayter launched the coup d'etat within the FPO and systematically reorganized the party in the direction of the new right-wing populist or anti-establishment party. Since the late 1980s, Therefore, the FPO has been able to position itself as one of the three major parties, however, not fully abandoning its tradition in anti-Semitism. The era of economic globalization since the 1990s and Austria's accession to the European Union in 1995 resulted in fundamental social changes. Austerity policies, cuts in social welfare provision, the creation of low-wage sectors, and the consolidation of precarious working conditions have led to rising unemployment, the precarization of working conditions, growing social disintegration, and raising poverty. This neoliberal restructuring has nurtured fears of social degradation, marginalization, and the insecurity of both the working and lower middle classes. As a result of these transformations, both 
the Austrian two-party system and the social partnership model lost their legitimacy. This situation created a window of opportunity for the participation of civil society groups, for the establishment of new parties such as the Greens, but also for the FPO to enter the political stage. The FBO campaigned particularly on opposing the consensus-oriented system of social partnership as a corrupt system. Hence, it was able to criticize the neoliberal project, which in its view stood for the politics of deterioration, in need of a new legitimization strategy. While the neoliberal project tried to disempower workers' organizations, the FPO shifted antagonism of workers versus employers to new antagonisms such as anti-establishment, lazy unemployed, and migrants who were now portrayed as a burden. This strategy was successful in winning support at least from a group which seemed and feared to be affected by the restructurings of the neoliberal project, namely the Austrian workers. Hence, it is not surprising that con the conservative Wolfgang Schussel of the Austrian People's Party, OVP, found a partner in the FPO for a government coalition after the 1999 national elections. This coalition of 2000 was subjected to a fierce national and EU criticism. Nevertheless, FPO and later BZO remained in government until 2006 and pushed through a neoliberal agenda by weakening the unions and the Chamber of Labor. After Hayter's death in 2008, Haynes Christian Strace reoriented the FPO on an anti-immigration and anti-Muslim course. However, migration had already become an important topic for the FPO with the introduction of the Austria First referendum in 1993 by the FPO, calling for a curb on immigration and restrictive immigration laws. Since then, the FPO has systematically established discourse of difference and exclusion, especially with regard to immigration, and since the turn of the century, the Muslims. As the established parties, the especially the Social Democrats, have also moved away from the idea of equality. The FPO propagated antagonisms diligent versus lazy workers, or our people versus migrants, became increasingly common parlance. In the following years, FPO's demands were increasingly implemented into a restrictive immigration and asylum system. Looking at some of the claims of the Austrian First Referendum, it is clear that Austria, with respect to the discourse as well as the legislation, was never closer to these back then no-go claims than ever before in the history of the Second Republic. A comprehensive shift in migration legislation by Alien Law of 2005 was pushed through, hence some of the initially no-go claims of the 1990s became exclusionary laws in the frame of the shift towards more inequality among the established parties in general. This backdrop of restrictive migrancy policy and communal racism towards migrants and Muslims introduced on a global level, especially after 9-11, further paved the way for anti-Muslim civil initiatives, which as those opposing the building of mosques, to jump on this hegemonic bandwagon of difference, inequality, and exclusion. The anti-mosque movements did not necessarily introduce new topics, but rather intensified the already existing discourse against immigrants and Muslims, which was strongly shaped by the FPO. Nevertheless, as we will argue below, citizens' initiatives mainly focus on anti-Muslim racism, while the FPO's claims are more diverse, also focusing on the antagonism between us, the Austrians, and them, the migrants in general. Fighting for hegemony, racism as a social practice. Once and for all, I will state this principle. A given society is racist or it is not. In this section, we elaborate our concept of racism and hegemony by discussing particular characteristics 
forms and functions of racism. Understanding racism as a social practice gives an indication of why right-wing populist and extremist groups are successful and why, although present in a great number, anti-racist, anti-fascist, and anti-discrimination movements and parties that follow inclusionary politics are marginalized and in a weak position. In the context of right-wing extremist and populist groups, racism as one of their major ideological pillars is often discussed as an extreme practice. We argue, following Tertestis, that racism is not a phenomenon located on the fringes of society, but has to be understood as a social practice functional for European societies. In Colette Gulamin's understanding, racism is an everyday behavior, as well as being embedded in state and institutional structures. Its banality, the fact that it has deeply embedded in everyday practices and it has become a form of societal knowledge explains its persistence. Moreover, racist thought patterns and undisputed practices build a solid foundation for right-wing populists to create a shared purpose and a hegemonic discourse based on natural inequality and hence exclusion. As we shall see, racism as a social practice is used in Austria for the political project of right-wing parties and groups. Both focus their strategy to, at the same time, reach and construct the people by creating antagonistic chains of equivalence between an us versus the other, be it migrants, the elites, the establishment, feminist, or homosexuals. At the same time, they appeal to society as a family, to national purity, and to order. The construction and legitimization of difference and inequality based on biological or cultural arguments is central to racist practices. This struggle for hegemony therefore includes gender as well as sexuality to stress the argument of biology. It includes first the production of knowledge with regard to allegedly distinct groups of humans, also known as process of racialization. This form of knowledge gives meaning to certain characteristics in order to classify and divide human beings. Second, racist hegemony encompasses practices of exclusion of particular groups from material, cultural, and symbolic resources. Hence, right-wing discourse and strategies include inequality and difference as characteristics. In the following, we discuss the characteristics and functions of racism on which our analysis of the discursive strategies of two right-wing groups and counter-strategies rests. Racism as social practice and a struggle for hegemony includes processes of racialization, social processes by which meanings are attributed to real or imagined human characteristics. Moreover, practices of exclusion based on racialization contribute to a right-wing racist project, however with important contextual differences. While biological racism has been to a certain extent replaced with the new rights discourse and strategy, the construction of cultural differences, racialization based on cultural characteristics and exclusionary practices has become more evident. However, this does not mean that nature is banned from right-wing discourse. On the contrary, an important characteristic of processes of racialization is to give meaning to allegedly phenotypical to sociological, symbolic, or imaginary differences, while at the same time presenting these characteristics as natural differences. Classification on natural and cultural grounds not only serves to hierarchize groups, but also to exclude certain groups or to force these groups to be assimilated. New forms of racism, for instance ethnopluralism, do not explicitly hierarchize, but call for the preservation of different cultural units, allegedly perceived as equally important, but for the right and duty to be different. However, this also leads to separation into distinct groups. Furthermore, the right and duty to be different naturalize the idea of our folk and implies that the presence of others in the cultural unit is already problematic. Therefore, racialization involves power, 
as it shifts power to the us group and at the same time disempowers the others. Hence, the power to differentiate is linked to a particular practice of exclusion or the power of one group to exclude the other from material, cultural, or symbolic resources. Symbolic exclusion, then, is the allocation of the constructed group of others outside the family of nation, the us group. Against this backdrop of symbolic exclusion is a process that not only intensifies the construction of the other, but also serves to consolidate the us group as homogeneous and as sharing a common set of values. To put it another way, the antagonistic relationship of us and them refers to the fear of not knowing who we are. Therefore, the others serve as the mirrored, introverted opposite of the own values. Racism as a social practice of racialization and exclusion through inclusion not only legitimizes the privileges of the us group, but aims at establishing a consensus within the us group, and hence cultural hegemony. We might conclude that right-wing populism establishes a political project of racism as a hegemonic practice. The fact that right-wing discourse appeals to existing racist knowledge and actively creates racist antagonism by evoking chains of equivalence of sexism, homophobia, anti-intellectualism, and anti-elitism explains, to a certain extent, the success of the right wing in fostering discourses of difference and inequality, as well as exclusionary practices and institutions. Our analysis of two Austrian right wing organizations in the following section will discuss the discursive strategies which serve the construction of a particular other, currently constructed as the Muslims and the migrants the naturalization of differences between us and them, and the legitimization of symbolic exclusion. Right-wing discourses in Austria constructing others intensifying difference, inequality, and exclusion. Back then, a particular ethnic group was blamed. Today, it is a different one. The FBO and the citizens' initiatives against the building of mosques fed into racist discourses by intensifying the idea of natural and irreconceivable difference among human beings or groups. In current right-wing discourses in Austria, we have identified two forms of racism, one focusing on Muslims, the other on migrants, as a constructed other. The latter can be understood as xeno-racism, as Liz Fickett convincingly argued. In xeno-racist articulations, it is the foreigner, or migrant, who is constructed as the other. An ideological grounding against the constructed others is missing in such articulations, and the antagonism is rather based on the naturalized logic of ethnicized competition. In the following, we will describe right-wing discursive strategies that construct the unequal other symbolically excluding this other and legitimizing the superiority and privileges of the us group. This demonstrates how right-wing groups intensify discourses of difference and in doing so appeal to the racist knowledge that is embedded in society and create a common sense of inequality and exclusion. Migrants, a conditional inclusion. Since the FBO's Austria first referendum in 1993, Migration has become the key topic in Austrian right-wing populism. Since then, migration has acted as a catalyst for the party's transformation into the populist party. The FBO's major mobilization strategy includes a shift towards an antagonistic understanding of the relationship of us and them, represented by migrants. The referendum called for restrictions on immigration. Although the referendum was not successful, it was the starting point for a transformation of Austrian public discourse on migration. Its nativist rhetoric is still present in the current discursive strategies. Following the logic of racism, the FPO constructs antagonism between migrants of the us group while leaving open the question of who actually belongs to this group of us. To make the people an empty signifier feeds the idea that everybody knows who belongs and who does not belong, 
who is Austrian and who is not. In other words, not defining the people suggests a common understanding and consenting definition of this entity. The alleged contradiction between us and them, moreover, underlines that the symbolic inclusion of migrants in the us group is conditional and this feeds into the racist construction of the migrant other. Austria first. First, we have to look after our people and those who have migrated here but already Austrian, or who are not yet Austrian but are well integrated and who work who are not criminal. Then I don't care whether or not they already have Austrian citizenship, whether or not they are neo Austrians. Once he is an Austrian, then he is an Austrian, regardless where he came from. He just has to behave properly. The statement Austria First, already used in 1993, points on the one hand to the importance of policies that serve the needs of our people. On the other hand, it constructs our people as commonly understood. However, the FPO official above cited takes upon himself to define and expand the notion of the people. In his statement, he includes migrants who have acquired Austrian citizenship but at the same time, he defines important characteristics of our people, those who are well integrated and who work, who are not criminal, and those who behave properly. It is thus citizenship on the one hand and a set of common values on the other hand, which seem to be the criteria for inclusion. However, this belonging and inclusion is only conditional. Migrants with Austrian citizenship are singled out as neo-Austrians in contrast to a genuine us group, probably based on the understanding of a homogeneous folk of Austrians, essential to racist discourse of right-wing groups in Austria. This is also evident in other statement, which differentiates among allegedly homogeneous migrant groups, again demonstrating that Christianity can serve as a criterion for inclusion and that the construction of the rather different other the Muslims, Christianity serves as a natural common ground for understanding in contrast to the alleged natural difference of Muslims. The following quote illustrates this division between migrants who fit and those who don't fit by referring to religion and to sort of natural national pride. Because we have cared a lot about the Serbs as a voter group, because they are Christians like us, we have more in common with them than with the Muslims, the Turks. They do not speak German perfectly, but they work to integrate and do not stand out negatively. They often come to us because they are from countries where national pride is the norm. The FPO party official frames the Serbs as similar to us by claiming that they work and integrate and do not stand out negatively. At the same time, he constructs this group of migrants in position to the Muslims and to Turks. While Serbs are included in the Christian us, Muslims and Turks are excluded from this us group due to a lack of similarities, lack of language knowledge, and lack of a shared value of national pride. Hence, the antagonism between us and Muslims is presented as irreconceivable while other migrant groups, such as refugees, might be included if they behave properly or do not exploit the asylum system. This differentiation among the constructed groups of migrants further demonstrates the mechanism of hierarchization inherent in most forms of racism. Muslims Anti-Muslim racism is not only the most obvious form of racism applied by the FPO and the Viennese Citizens Initiatives but has become the main form of racist articulation among Europe's right. Although both the FPO and the Citizens Initiatives use anti-Muslim racism, we argue that this is the main issue for the Citizens Initiative, while the FPO is constructing their enemy in a more diverse way, as discussed above in the form of xenoracism. The inequality debate is apparent in the construction of Muslims' insurmountable difference serving as legitimization for their symbolic exclusion. They do not fit into Austria's culture because of their alleged different values, different habits, and customs, 
and different appearance and behavior. I don't accept that we have to make adjustments. Pork disappeared from kindergarten, but not for health reasons, because it is no worse than beef or turkey. The crucifix has also been disappearing in schools, and the Nicolo celebration is also partially abandoned because the children are afraid, but they were afraid also back then, or simply they were not. That is a part of our tradition. The FPO's anti-Muslim mobilization since 2009 has focused on the veiled Muslim women. They are presented both victims of their patriarchal family and as perpetrators, as they are seen as unwilling to integrate. Free women instead of forced veiling, one of the party's election slogans of 2005, not only constructs the Muslim female other, but also the emancipated us group. These constructions can be labeled as elements of anti-Muslim racism as they tend to naturalize differences and suggest, at least symbolically, excluding Muslims from Austrian society. This framing also shows how right-wing populist antagonism uses gender difference and the issue of sexual identity to construct and exclude the other and to integrate the us. The FPO has successfully spread anti-Muslim racist sentiments. As one consequence, citizens' initiatives against mosques in several Austrian cities have emerged and anti-Muslim racism has become the single central issue for citizens' initiatives. They outline various reasons why the building of Islamic centers and mosques in Vienna is a problem. One argument, for instance, is noise pollution, perceived as a problem due to the concentration of people and the volume of traffic during prayers in the area where the center was to be built. However, as the statements below show, the mere presence of foreign people is also portrayed as the problem, again implying a natural difference between the people who are scared and the foreigners. The problem with the Islamic Cultural Center is disturbance. Accordingly, partly aggressive behavior when the people are requested to be less loud. Then there is no peace, but it comes to offensive behavior and therefore people feel threatened. One interviewee from FPO made a similar argument. People are now afraid that many people will come together. They see many foreigners of whom they are afraid of anyway. It is more symbolic character and the gathering of foreign-looking people that scares people. They are really frightened by it. Difference, we contend, is intensified by right-wing populist discourses. Muslims are constructed as a threat and disturbance as they are innately louder, gesticulate more, and stand together in groups more often because they come from southern Mediterranean countries. In the statements above, FPOs and civil initiatives officials both refer to a common sense of anxiety and perceived danger in the Austrian population. Migrants, especially Muslims, are perceived as offensive by the Austrians. Austrians are therefore scared by Muslims. The Muslim foreigner is constructed on a different level, one being alleged difference in values as the following statement shows. They overrun us and make demands. But I don't want to live like that. We developed from the Middle Ages up. We fought to be able to vote for Social Security, to live in peace, and now I have to give it up because of religious war? That's what will happen. The we are perceived as enlightened, having developed since the Middle Ages and established peace and Social Security. At the same time, Muslims are seen as importing war to peaceful Austria, as uncivilized, and barbaric and therefore as a threat to the own values. This statement shows a discourse of difference and inequality intensified to feed into anti-Muslim racism, which serves to consolidate the us group. This consolidation often takes the road of femonationalism, as Sarah Ferris calls the creation of gender equal in-group by the framing of a patriarchal out-group. Gender and Gender Equality Politics The intersection of religion and gender creates another antagonism. The issue of traditional gender roles in Muslim communities versus gender equality in Austrian society. When girls walk alone around to the subway, the bus, the foreign youth declares open season on them. Or not the youth, but mostly the Turks. 
They whistle or talk to them stupidly. It's not comfortable, and then they do not dare go out in the evening alone. In the above statement, the foreign youth, or Turks, are portrayed as not following gender equality rules, and contrasted to an imagined youth, foreign boys or men are accused of harassing native girls and failing to value the integrity of women. Hence, migrant young men are perceived as aggressive perpetrators and a threat to Austrian girls and women. On the other hand, Austrian girls are seen as victims, disciplined through fear. However, our analysis shows rather contradictory strategies with regard to gender equality claims. Gender equality is by no means a political project of the right-wing groups. On the contrary, man and woman are perceived as different by nature in right-wing ideology and discourse. The constructed others are, for example, portrayed as family units, where the woman is not allowed to leave the house without the man, while on the other hand, the FPO in particular is trying to enforce a traditional gender order. Again, the gender issue serves as an arena to create a common cause against gender equality policies by claiming that women in general are not interested in politics and that feminist demands for gender equality are against women's own will. We should introduce 50-50, refers to a potential gender quota in his party, meaning that half of the representatives should be women. Then it is men who would be discriminated against, because interestingly, it is men who are more interested in politics than women. You can see that in private life too. My girlfriend is not interested in it at all. Our analysis shows that right-wing discourse relies on natural difference between men and women, as other authors have shown. For instance, one representative criticizes the social shift that women do not want to have children because they are forced into wage labor. While women's decision not to have children has seen as detrimental to the Austrian nation, the political elite and feminists are held responsible for this decline of the birth rate. The blaming of elites here represented by the Liberal Greens and Social Democrats, is illustrated by the following statement, in which an FPO representative explains why Austrian society is endangered by youth who are becoming increasingly irresponsible. This social change, with more and more women having to work and daycare outside of the home increasing, I believe that you cannot learn social skills and daycare outside the home, as the Greens and the SPO argue. I still argue that it is the family that can teach children how to behave. The struggles of counter strategies, civil organizations fighting racism and discrimination. To live in a society without anti-racist policies means to be condemned to live in a racist society. In a reaction to the FPO's Austrian first referendum of 1993, 250,000 people gathered on the streets of Vienna to protest against this petition in a demonstration named Sea of Lights. Civil society organizations mobilized against the FPO and were able to unite other parties against this exclusionary referendum. This was a starting point for the emergence of the great number of civil society organizations against racism and discrimination which in the aftermath of the referendum created a constant counter-hegemonic project against racism, sexism, and homophobia. In this section, we elaborate on existing strategies and outline the possible successes and failures of civil society organizations fighting racism and right-wing extremism and their potential to establish counter-hegemony. Counter-hegemony, we contend, needs, first of all, to deconstruct the chains of equivalence and hence shared arguments against difference and inequality by stressing the right to difference and necessity of equality and equal treatment. In general, we found that in the context of everyday racism, of exclusionary hegemonic racism, as embedded in everyday practices, including sexism and homophobia, it is difficult to mobilize on a large scale and especially permeate social and institutional practices. The following describes first how representatives of anti-racist and anti-discriminatory civil society organizations perceive this context of racism as everyday 
institutionalized practice in the chilly climate of Austria, and second, the variety of strategies they adopt. Some representatives working in asylum and migration legal counseling perceive institutional racism as one of the major problems in Austria. They identify racism as an exercise of power, applied especially by civil servants and judges. The same representatives are also critical of an institutional racism, creating increasing restrictions in immigration law and, as it is framed, the criminalization of asylum seekers. Migrants and asylum seekers, they state, encounter systematic malignancy state institutions and legal proceedings. Increasingly discriminatory practice is, furthermore, identified in the context of citizenship laws and job opportunities for migrants. An organization which mainly focuses on anti-racist work by monitoring racist incidents points out that state institutions, and especially the police, are crucial to the reduction of racism. The representative of another documentation and monitoring organization stresses that they try to establish networks with the police in order to reach police officers and to make them aware of institutional racist practices. Hence, in the perception of civil society organizations, racism is linked not only to individual behavior, but also to institutional practices. Most representatives of anti-racist and anti-discrimination organizations perceive this as a major problem. They state that it is difficult to fight institutionally and socially embedded racist images and behavior. Nevertheless, the organizations engage in counter strategies against racism and discrimination. What could be a strength might also be a weakness when it comes to forming a strong counter hegemony to right wing racist discourses. Another drawback in this struggle for counter hegemony, which some representatives identified, is a lack of resources. Some civil society organizations receive state funding, however, most of them depend on donations. Their counter strategies can be surmised as engagement in four fields, education information, counseling, campaigning, and monitoring. Education information and awareness rising. Four of the organization's interviews are active in the field of empowerment education and remembrance work. This includes the provision of training and workshops for pupils, students, and companies in the field of anti-discrimination and anti-racism. One anti-racist organization's emphasis is on the education of 13 to 19-year-old pupils. The organization stresses issues of empowerment as well as civil awareness of racism or conflict resolution. Their aim is to develop agency in situations when young people observe or experience racist incidents. Another organization, focusing mainly on remembrance work and anti-fascist training, offers guided tours of memorial centers such as formal concentration camps. The organization focusing on documentation also provides workshops for the prevention of right-wing extremism and racism, also mainly targeting pupils. Its representative emphasizes the importance of a subject-oriented approach to anti-racism work. This strategy involves recognizing how racialization processes work by learning about oneself and not about the others. Another organization aims at raising awareness about institutional racism, which is manifest in everyday legal processes, especially in asylum-seeking proceedings. Counseling. Counseling for migrants and asylum seekers or others who experience racism is the main field of engagement of another group of four organizations. Counseling includes legal advice for victims of racist attacks, as well as general information on possible action against racism. Another counseling organization focuses on legal advice and psychosocial assistance for migrants, including advice in cases of discrimination by state institutions or in the workplace. One major strategy is to empower their clients by informing them about their rights. This information about migrants and refugees' rights seems to be the core of anti-discrimination work, as people who are not well informed about their rights are often the target of discrimination by authorities and institutional racism. While these organizations mainly focusing on counseling people who are affected by racism and discrimination, the organization 
focusing on documentation is also a contact point for information about neo-Nazi groups and right-wing popular culture, such as symbols, signs, and music. They counsel parents and provide advice on exit strategies. Campaigning, communication, and events. Campaigning against racism and right-wing extremism is another pillar of the most of the organizations we interviewed. One of the representatives emphasized that their aim is to weaken the right-wing dominated anti-immigration and anti-asylum discourse by promoting and lobbying for a greater equality in human rights. One of their campaigns pointed out the difficulties of the new Citizenship Act or the Red White Red Card, which only permits highly skilled people earning a certain amount of money to migrate to Austria for work. The organization is also involved in consultation on new legislation. Their lobbying activities have been successful to a certain extent in the past, when the authorities have made changes to parliamentary bills as a result of the organization's lobbying and campaigning. Another successful strategy of awareness, raising, and prevention of right-wing extremist gathering is the Festival of Joy, which is organized by another organization we interviewed. It takes place every year on the 8th of May to celebrate the liberation of Austria from National Socialism. It is furthermore a way of countering explicitly right-wing public presence. The celebration prevents right-wing fraternities from gathering at the Venice in remembrance of the fallen Austrian comrades, which they did annually until the first Festival of Joy in 2013. Similarly, other organizations report that they also organize events and demonstrations or launch campaigns in response to actual racist or discriminatory events. Monitoring. Monitoring of right-wing extremism, racism, and hate speech is a major focus of two of the organizations we interviewed, one focusing on anti-racism and the other on documentation. It seems to be increasingly difficult to monitor the right-wing extremist scene which is not easily accessible or highly visible in publicly available media. They seldom provide any publications or put information online. A further difficulty with monitoring and documentation work is the risk of reproducing the discourses of difference when citing or illustrating their home pages or speeches. Moreover, the prosecution for online racism is very difficult due to transnationality of online racism. Home pages are often anonymous and or located on servers overseas. This is why the representative analysis on the importance of international cooperation to fight racism online. As a result of this organization, joined the International Network Against Cyber Hate, which shares information and works to counter cyber hate internationally. The second organization, provides a platform for people who witness racism and discrimination in the public sphere, be it on the street, in state institutions, on television, or on the internet. It publishes reported cases and an annual racism report. Although these reports do not provide a representative picture of racist or discriminatory incidents in the country, they serve as the way of capturing trends, such as the increasing importance of the internet as a medium for racist attacks. In Austria, several important anti-racist and anti-discrimination organizations have developed various counter-strategies with regard to discrimination, racism, and right-wing extremism and populism. They provide legal, social, or psychosocial assistance, organize and launch anti-racism and anti-homophobic campaigns, fight anti-Semitism, and promote equality, human rights, and empowerment, and in particular with regard to the young. The fact that racism is inherent in Austrian society, embedded in the midst of society and state institution, renders it difficult to fight the discourses of difference and inequality. Against this backdrop, Austrian civil society organizations need a clearer shift towards discourses of equality and inclusion in order to engage in this common purpose.